Christmas Eve on uh, Sunday and also New Year's Eve and tomorrow we're all going to wake up with a, a new year ahead of us and, and maybe you're really looking forward to that and oftentimes as you know at this time of year as we reflect over uh, victories and we reflect over maybe past failures of the year many of us make uh, New Year's resolutions promises that we make to ourselves to, to make this new year better or maybe to make ourselves better in the new year. Here's the thing, statistically speaking, speaking, if you're making a resolution, it might be one of these four things. It might be that you resolve to lose weight, uh, to save more money, to get more organized or to be more healthy and active this year. Uh, but the statistics also tell us that more than 80% of New Year's resolutions made fail within the first two weeks of the new year. That cake just looks too good to pass up. Now, I think it's because the re resolutions we make, maybe our, our hearts aren't really in them. You know, we'd all like to be skinnier and richer and healthier and more organized, wouldn't we? Uh, but we don't necessarily want to do everything we need to get there. Or maybe, look, maybe you're saying, hey, listen, I'm comfortable in my skin, okay, and I have enough, and I know where to find my stuff, even if no one else does, and all that exercise, that's for the birds. They can keep it, okay, and that's fine too. But I do want to encourage you this morning, church, as Christians, as we study 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 17, I want to present to you four resolutions that every follower of Christ should make for this coming year, and they are these to resolve to long for eternity, to resolve to walk by faith, to resolve to live for Jesus, and to resolve to know everyone from a godly perspective. And so that's where we're going to go this morning. But first, before we do that, will you please bow your head and pray with me? Lord, we are constantly amazed by you. And if we think about the gospel long, it's amazing that you've saved us, Lord. It's amazing that you've called us to partner with you in this ministry of reaching the lost and this privilege of knowing your children born through the blood and sacrifice of Christ. Lord, we pray now that you would do a work here in, in this time, in the sermon, and that you would speak to our hearts and we'd be greatly encouraged by your word. Lord, that we would be greatly confronted by your word if need be, that we would not leave without experiencing you in your word. It's in your name we pray and ask this. Amen. 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 So number one, as we, as we get into the text here, um, we're going to uh, talk about the first one, which is we're going to resolve to long for eternity. Now, I should have opened up my Bible. That'd be pretty smart, wouldn't it? We're preaching God's word. Uh, let me get to our text here in 2 Corinthians. So let me read you the first four verses of our passage this morning. Here's what Paul says. He's talking to the Corinthian church. He says, For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens not made with hands. Indeed, we groan in this tent, desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling, since when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. Indeed, we groan while we are in this tent, burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality, so that death, may be swallowed up by life. And so what Paul is doing in the very beginning of this address in chapter 5 is he is setting up a contrast between the tent, which is our earthly bodies, where we live now, and the building that he says is not made with hands. That is our heavenly bodies. That is what we, every believer, that promise we have, that we will have a resurrection body, not dabbled with sin, and that we will have something that lasts for eternity. And he's saying, we groan in this tent this earthly body, but we have something better. And the, the main point of verses 1 through 4 is he's saying what is to come is far better than what we are experiencing right now. Are you grateful for that promise? Amen? This body, he says, is a tent. What is to come is a building. And it's not made with human hands where there can be no error. 
Now, I, I love camping. I don't know if you know that about me, but I love to camp. And I like sleeping in a tent. In fact, when we go on vacation in the summer, that's exactly what we do. We go up into the mountains in Cherokee, North Carolina, and we sleep in a tent for a whole week. But at the end of that week, we are glad to be back in a building with air conditioning. And my wife is glad to be with showers as she slept with a bunch of stinky men in a tent. Well, and Rebecca, all right? The tent that we sleep in for the week is not better than the building. It's not better than the parsonage, right? We're glad to come back to that. And, and this building that followers of Christ are promised, he, Paul says it's made not with human hands, but it's made with God's hands. It is created and it is crafted perfectly by God himself. And he's talking about the resurrection body that all followers of Christ are given. It, it, it's in the moment when the new spirit, listen, when you were saved, you received that new heart and that new spirit. It's at that moment that your new spirit will finally match the body that you get to live in for eternity. Versus now where we have these new redeemed spirits, these hearts changed for Christ, and we live in what Paul calls these bodies of death, right? And Paul describes this. He describes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 54. Look with me. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, this is when Christ comes back, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, unable to be corrupted and will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body that dies must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This is the promise that Christ gives every follower of Christ. What God has in store for those who love him is far better than what this life has to offer. Amen? Amen. Now listen, it's not that this life doesn't have good in it, right? God is a good father, and he blesses us, but the good things in this world that is soaked with sin are just proof that there are far better things in the presence of the father. Follower of Christ, this is not your best life. Listen, Joe Osteen, you might know that name. If you go on TBN, <coughs> you can see him smiling, perpetually smiling behind that gigantic spinning globe, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, I wouldn't advise you spend a lot of time watching him. But he, he wrote a book called Your Best Life Now. This is his best-selling book. And his book, the premise of it, was all about how God wants you to experience your best life right now, right here on earth. That everything you could possibly want is what God has in store for you. But, but Osteen's book, listen, Osteen's book gravely misunderstands the highest treasure of the Christian life. This is not our best life, and it's not meant to be. We are destined, listen, we are destined by the grace of God to experience God himself in the next life without limit, without hindrance, without sin. The greatest gift of God to us is God himself. Amen? Amen. And that is to come, church, when we possess the building not made with hands. When we have that resurrection body, this is the promise given to every single believer. Now look at verse 5 with me. Verse 5 says this, Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, as a down payment. The eternal Spirit within us is the down payment of the eternal body to come. Believer, eternity is your destination. This is a short period of time in the long, long, listen, if you think about it like a rope or a chain link, a chain link, think about it like that, that stretches for millions of miles. This life here is one link in that chain, okay? Eternity is our destination. And so I need to ask this question. If eternity is our destination, why do so many of us live like this life is all that we've got? 
like this is it. Is that the way that you're living? Like this life has the best to offer you. I want to encourage you to resolve this year to long for eternity, to long for that time where you will be whole and complete and not to put your stock and your treasure in this world. Paul says in verse 2 that we, we groan in this tent. How, how many of you uh, can relate to groaning in this tent? I'm only 33, but I, I feel like I groan more and more every day, okay? Um, we can relate to that. We groan in this tent. And then he continues and he says that they desire, listen, they desire to put on the heavenly dwelling. Let me ask you, do you desire to put on the heavenly dwelling? Do you desire to be with the Lord? Whenever I was a new believer, when I just got saved, in talking with other Christians and in being in church, I picked up that Christ coming back was supposed to be a really good thing. But if, if I was honest with you, if you asked me, I didn't really want him to come back. I, I wanted to experience what the world had to offer before I died, before I went to heaven. I experienced, I, I thought that this world maybe had more to offer than heaven did. And so I said, Jesus, I want you to come back, but, but not before I get married first, okay? Or, or maybe you're, I want you to come back, Jesus, but not before this career, or, or not before I see my grandkids, or not before we get to go on this vacation, right? Have you ever had that thought? Well, Jesus, I, I want you to come back, but maybe not yet. Listen, Vickery and I have been married for 11 years yesterday, okay? 11 years yesterday, we've been married. And when God gave me Vickery Sullivan, he gave me a really, really good gift. He did. He gave me a good gift. But church, Vickery Jackson is not better than holy God. Amen? If Christ had returned before I could marry her, I would not have been at a loss. Now, maybe you're thinking, maybe my wife's just better than your wife. I guarantee you that's not it, okay? It's not that. It's that God is so much better than anything we could experience. If anything is better in your mind, then being in the presence of your Savior, you have a low view of God. And I want to encourage you to pick up the view of God that his scripture gives us. Amen? Amen. Listen, that, that job, that experience, whatever that thing is that, that you really want here on earth, it is not better than being with God. It's not better than being with the one who loves you perfectly the one who created you, the one who died for you and, and who gave you a new spirit and has waiting for you a new body and a home in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Amen? So this year in 2018, I'll, I'll, and really for the rest of our lives, church, I want us to long for eternity, to look forward to that time and, and to desire for others that they would have this promise that we also have. And in fact, if we look in Scripture, Christ tells us to pray for this. Look with me at the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name be considered holy. Your kingdom, what? Come. It's the second thing we pray for in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, you are holy. Your kingdom, come. Come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. This is not inconsequential. Listen, Christ taught us in Matthew 6, 21. What are you saying? Where your heart is, your treasure is, right? Where your heart is, your treasure is also. What you long for impacts the direction of your life, how you live. If your treasure is God in eternity, you will live in such a way that earns treasure in heaven. That, that works towards your eternity. Not that you have to earn your eternity. Don't mistake me. That's given to you in Christ. But your life's direction will be in such that is in concert with where you will spend eternity. And if your treasure is here on earth, if this is where your best life is now, and where the best things you can experience are right now, that's where you'll live. And that's what you'll work for. Do you long for the better life to come? Or do you order your life, church, in such a way that you work for eternity? Or do you spend your life amassing treasures that will fade and disappear when you die? 
will you resolve with me to long for eternity? Second one, will you resolve to walk by faith? Read verse 6 with me. So we are always confident. It's a good word. We are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Let me stop here for just a second. This is connected to our resolve to walk by faith, to living in the Spirit. And Paul is saying that we're confident. And he'll say this again in a moment. He says we're confident because of the down payment of the Holy Spirit. We're confident of what is to come. And then he says we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. This is what Paul means when he says later that to live is Christ, on earth to live is Christ for his will, and to die is gain, to go to heaven. <coughs> and he's saying two things here. Physically, listen, in the context, he's saying physically to be at home in this body, in this tent, is to be physically away from the Lord, right? So he's saying that. But there's also a spiritual principle here, church, that, that is applicable to our lives. To be at home in this body is to be away from the Lord. That is, to be comfortable in this flesh will always lead you away from the Lord. To embrace this world, to embrace this flesh, the natural inclinations of our sinful hearts, will always put us in a direction that will take us away from the Lord. Remember, our heart has been made new, amen? But the flesh is still sinful. And there's that struggle that we all experience that struggle that we all experience that Paul talks about in Romans 7, 15 through 20. Look what he says. This is Paul talking. And if you don't relate with this, just listen. For I do not understand what I'm doing. Have you ever had that thought in your head? Why did I do that? Okay. Because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I don't want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one who does it, but it's the sin that lives within me. And that's a lot of do's and do nots. But, but that boils down to this is that Paul is struggling with the renewed heart and the sinful flesh. And, and I don't know about you, but I can, I can relate to that, okay? I can relate to that when Vickery asked me to do something and, and to follow Jesus, I serve my wife and say, yes, I'll go do that for you. But instead I go, oh, could you just do it, right? That's not loving my wife well. Now, listen, I know everyone's done that, okay? We struggle in the flesh. Now, let me warn you. If you don't feel this struggle, as I can see it, there are only two options. If you don't feel the struggle of your flesh against your renewed heart, there's only two options. Option one, you're perfect. You don't struggle with your sinful flesh because there isn't any sin there. Now, listen, I got a quiz for you to help you figure out if you're in category one. Is your name Jesus Christ? Are you the son of God? No? Okay. We're not in option one. And, and here's the second one, the, the more dangerous one. The other option, if you don't feel this struggle of your flesh against your renewed heart, is it is very possible you are far down a path of ignoring the spirit and your conscience has been seared by habitual sin. So much so that you no longer see what you are doing as sin how you're living, what you take pleasure in. In church, this is very dangerous because your salvation is in question. Please hear that. Because if you are in Christ, verse 17 of our passage today, you are a new creation and the old has passed away and the new has come. Verse 6 says to be at home in the body is to be away from the Lord. Now look with me at verses 7 through 10. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We're going to come back to that. It, in fact, we are confident and we would prefer 
to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. <clears throat> Now, Paul says again, we are confident. We are confident in what is to come, what God has in store for us. We are so confident in this that we would prefer to be away from the body. We would prefer to be dead and with the Lord. Do you have this confidence? Do you have this confidence that I would prefer? Listen, and I know that's a weird thing to say. No, pastor, I don't prefer to be dead, okay? Well, neither would I. I don't want to leave behind my family. But do you prefer, would you prefer in best circumstances the Lord come back right now? and that you could be with the Lord. The late R.C. Sproul was a wonderful pastor and a theologian. Uh, he's recently just died. He's very impactful in my life. He said this about death. Look with me. The vocation of dying is a sacred vocation. To understand that is one of the most important lessons a Christian can ever learn. When the summons comes from God, we can respond in many ways. We can be angry. We can be bitter or terrified, but if we see it as a call from God and not a threat from Satan, we are far more prepared to cope with its difficulties. Do you have that confidence that even your death is a good thing from the Lord? Hebrews 9.27 tells us that we all must have one life and then we face judgment. In confidence, church, you know this. If you don't, I hope you do. Confidence in this moment of death, to be able to say that I would prefer to be dead, that I would prefer to face judgment, and to be with the Lord, to be confident in death is only possible through Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us that Romans 3.23, we have all sinned, we have all fallen short. That is, every person on their own at judgment falls short of God's standard of holiness, and on our own we are guilty before a holy God. But Christ came, didn't he? Christ came and he lived a perfect, sinless life of righteousness so that he could be our substitute. See, if he had been sinful like we had been, it wouldn't have been any good, would it? Do you change out a flat tire with a flat tire? No. You get a new working tire. On the cross, God traded Christ's righteousness his perfect sinlessness for your sin and your disobedience and your rebellion, and he bore the punishment for your sin. In turn, God offers you his perfect righteousness. Is that a good trade? That's the best trade you could ever hope for. It's better than you're going to get on a used car lot, I, I guarantee you, okay? That's what God's word tells us. This is the promise and the hope of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says it. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That is so good. And, and that's the key word, though, might. This has not been automatically applied to you, to every person. Not every person goes to heaven just because Christ died. You must believe. You must confess that you are a sinner in need of God's grace. And if that is you, if you know that you do wrong in your life, as we all do, and that if you were to stand before holy God, that he would judge you in your sin, if you know that you are in trouble, Romans 10.9 has good news for you. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what does it say? You will be saved. It's that simple, church, because we needed it to be that simple. Amen? You can have the confidence that Paul has. You can have the confidence that R.C. Sproul has and that every follower of Christ has in death if you come to the cross and you surrender. You surrender. The Christian walk is a walk after Christ, following after him, seeking to be pleasing to him. In church, we cannot be pleasing to God unless we walk by faith. That's why in 2018, I hope you will resolve with me to walk by faith and not by sight. Now listen, this is harder than it sounds, right? What does that mean? I've been recently trying to explain the Trinity to my son, Noah, okay? He's eight. You can imagine how this is going. 
He mentioned uh, something a couple weeks ago about Jesus being God's son. And I told him, I said, yeah, that's, that's true, Noah. But um, he's also God. Jesus is also God. And he's been grappling with this concept of God being three persons and, and one God and not three separate gods. And I told him, well, you're in good company. <laughs> a lot of people grapple with this. And yesterday he came into my office uh, as I was working and he said, Dad, I still don't get how God is three but one. Uh, three and one are two separate things, okay? He has enough sense to go, they're not the same. And I told him, I said this, and if you have a better way to explain this, you let me know, okay? Because uh, I'm trying to help him understand. But I told him this, I said, did you know in Isaiah 6, 3, that the Bible says about God three times, that God is holy, 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 okay? What does holy mean? Holy means different. Holy means set apart. It means other than. Son, God is completely not like us. He is totally different. There are things about God, like his three-in-oneness, that just don't make sense to us that live in this physical world. But son, God tells us to walk by faith, not by sight. Listen, this means that I'm going to believe, now I didn't say this, but listen to me. This means I'm going to believe what God says, amen? It, it means what God promises that I can't see with my own eyes, I'm going to believe. I'm going to live my life believing what God says. I'm going to have faith that the holy God of the universe, the one who created everything and knit me together, that he knows better than me. And I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to walk by faith when, when I'm going through a low valley in life, when, when the odds are stacked against me, when I don't see a way out and Satan is whispering into my ears, I'm going to walk by faith, amen? amen. I'm going to walk by faith, not my sight, because my sight is fearful. My, my sight is suspicious and it's selfish. I'm going to believe that God is who he says he is. And because of what my Lord Jesus has done on the cross, that I am who God says I am, a beloved child of God. And that I can be confident in the eternal life to come, that I have a building not made with human hands. Amen? Amen. Listen, I'm going to walk by faith in my marriage. I'm going to walk by faith in my job. Let me, let me go back. I'm going to walk by faith in my marriage. That means when the Bible tells me that I'm to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Well, Christ died for the church, didn't he? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Follow God's word. It's a novel idea. It might help your marriage. He's always right when I'm wrong. Listen, I'm going to walk by faith as a father. I'm going to walk by faith as a friend. I'm going to try to walk by faith as an ambassador of Christ, and as an alien in this world whose home is somewhere else in distant heaven. I'm going to walk by faith, church, because walking by faith is to walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus. And church, because the world has seen enough of the brokenness that comes when we walk by our sight. Amen? So will you please resolve with me to walk by faith. These last two will move a little quicker here. We want to resolve to walk by faith. We also want to resolve to live for Jesus, to live our lives for Jesus. Look with me at verse 11. Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, okay, that's an important Fear. It's not cowering from the Lord. That is to know that the Lord is holy, that he is just, he is a God of justice, and that he will judge sin and not just overlook it. That's what it means to fear the Lord. To know that you need, that he is someone to be feared when you approach him in your sin. Okay? The Israelites understood this. That's why there was a veil in the temple. They knew to fear the Lord as they approached in their sin. Verse 11, Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people, okay? What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your consciences. Just, just notice with me, please, the relationship between knowing the Lord and being evangelistic. He says, we know the Lord, we fear the Lord, and therefore, we try to persuade people. I'm losing my voice, I'm sorry. 
Later in this passage, Paul is going to say we plead with people to be reconciled to God, to know the Lord, and to plead with the lost goes hand in hand, church. Read with me verse 12. We'll get back to that in just a minute, but continue with me in verse 12. He says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you may have a reply for those who take pride in outward appearance rather than in the heart. Okay? Living for Christ is to take notice of your heart, to take inventory of your heart and what's going on in there. Jesus said in Matthew 15 that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? Your mouth, your actions, show the true nature of your heart. Please know that. Please look at the, the way you speak, the things that you do, and know that that's the true way of your heart. Okay? Living for Christ, listen, we were talking in Sunday school this morning about how to strengthen the church. We were talking about how the church is not made up of, we're all individuals, right? We're building blocks that make up the building of the church. And the church is only as strong as we are as individuals, okay? Living for Christ, church, is not about putting on the Christian show and being good for the watching eyes of others, it's not about hiding our sin from one another, okay? It's about encouraging each other to kill that sin and to follow Jesus, amen? We can't do that if we hide from one another. We can't do that. Read with me verses 13 through 15 as we continue. <clears throat> For, he continues, if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Paul says we've reached an important conclusion. If Christ died for all, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He says, if Christ died for all, then all are dead. And they all needed someone to die for them so they could come to life. That's his conclusion. And he says, in this conclusion, verse 14, the love of Christ compels them. It compels them to act. He says in verse 13, he says this real weird thing in 13. Kind of confuses you for a second. He says, uh, if we are out of our mind, it's for God. And if we are in our right mind, it's for you. Well, what does he mean by that? What's, what is he talking about? He, he's saying that if we seem out of our mind to you, it's out of our mind that we're following God. And if we seem in our right mind to you, then it benefits you. It's for you. And here's the translation. We're going to follow Christ, even when you think it's crazy. We're going to love like he commands us to, even when it looks crazy. We're going to forgive like he commands us to, even when the world says that looks crazy, right? If it doesn't seem crazy to you, if you get it, then God is using it to benefit you. But either way, we're going to walk with the Lord and we might seem crazy. And church, let me just say this. The world could use a little more loving Jesus in radical ways where the church says that looks crazy. I want it. Okay? They don't need more of the same. They need crazy, obedient love to Jesus. And so will you resolve in 2018 to live for Jesus? To put his mission and his call on your life first in this tiny chain link of time we have before we spend eternity before the Lord. Last one, verse 16 and 17. And this is, let me not say the most important maybe the most applicable this morning. So if you're getting bored and you're saying, I just want to go eat lunch, please tune in with me for a minute, okay? Uh, I still got a minute, all right? That's what my clock says. Um, listen, resolve to know everyone from a godly perspective. Read me verse 16. Verse 16 says this. From now on, then... 
Okay, in, 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 in light of all of this, that we have this confidence that all have died, that Christ's love compels us, from now on then, we do not know anyone, anyone, from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, and he's saying because some of us have actually known Christ, we walked with him from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way because he's ascended. But, but focus on that first sentence with me. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. When your eyes have been opened by God to the truth of the world, you cannot forget. Christian, resolve with me. Do not forget that there is much at stake in this world. That every person you meet that has not surrendered to King Jesus will be judged justly for their sin and they will go to hell. That is the truth. That's what God's word says. And it is a tragic thing, church, if Christ's ambassadors do not call the lost to come to Christ. Resolve to see every person from a godly perspective. To see every person as an opportunity for King Jesus to be magnified and glorified as a lost person moves from death to life by his glorious act of love on the cross. Paul says from now on, because of our confident promise in the Lord, because of what has been done on our behalf, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. We see all of them as God sees them in desperate need of grace. And so I have to ask you an important question. Do you see everyone in your path, in your sphere of influence, and we all have them, we all have spheres of influence from a godly perspective? Or do you have sin-safe friends? Let me explain that. Do you have friends in your life that you know are lost, that act lost around you, and that you make no effort to share with them the only hope that they have in Jesus. They are your sin-safe friend. You just kind of cut loose with them. Maybe you do things that you know that you shouldn't do with them because they're lost. Listen to me. Listen. This is what that really is. Do you use their lostness the fact that they are going to go to hell as your personal time off from following Jesus. You act around them in ways that you would never act around church folk. And listen, as I say this, as I voice this, I know it sounds harsh. As I say this, you say, no, 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 I don't do that. Because it sounds so bad. And it is. But if you look at the actions of your life, do they agree with the protest of your lips? Please know I'm not trying to shame you. I'm not trying to beat you down. I hope the Holy Spirit convicts you that you are a vessel for Christ and that that lost person in your life desperately needs you to stand for Jesus Christ and to walk in the power of salvation and resurrection that's yours. Amen? I pray that you don't have to deal with the terrible heartache that comes with losing a lost friend to death, knowing that you had the gospel all along. And so I want to plead with you to resolve to see everybody from a godly perspective, your family members, your co-workers, the stranger on the street. You are a powerful force for God to work for. It's, it's not on you. You don't have to be so excellent at sharing the gospel that people believe. God does that work. He just asks you to be obedient and to love the lost enough to open your mouth and to make relationships and to give yourself the opportunity to be used by God. Will you do that? I pray that you will. As we close, listen to verse 17 of God's holy word. Therefore, if, listen to the gravity of this last sentence, and please take it as we examine our own hearts. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is 
a new creation. The old has passed away. And see, the new has come. The statement is clear in God's word. If you are a new creation, the old has gone and the new has come. It's not that you won't struggle. It's that you will see change. The life of a believer is marked by new change. And so as this year starts up amongst all the resolutions you might have or you don't have, I hope that you'll have at least these four with me. To long for eternity, to walk by faith, to live for Jesus, and to know everyone from a godly perspective. Amen? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the power of your word.